a very good afternoon once again. I tried to do my search, uh, Dr. Saran. How do you say hi in Thai? I couldn't find it, unfortunately. <laughs> Swani, thank, thank you very much. Um, let me welcome you to, to this event. Um, this is the Botswana International University of Science and Technology. Uh, that is in Palape. Palape is a village um, that is uh, 300 kilometers to the north of the capital city, Gaborone. Um, our visitors, you can see they are still carrying their luggage. They have not had time to check in straight from the flight into the bus, uh, hitting the road to Palape. And I hear uh, hunger uh, came when they were on their way. They had to stop in, in Mahalape to grab some food. So that's why we are starting just a little bit late, uh, 35 minutes into the program. But I would want to uh, uh, make us uh, begin the event. And before we could do that, I have not introduced myself. My name is Komo Telo. I am the director for the African VLBI network uh, and also the, S the square kilometer array uh, coordinator uh, for Botswana. Um, we'll get the opportunity to meet uh, the team that is responsible for astronomy here at BUST. Uh, it is custom uh, before we start any event for us to begin with a she moment and uh, I will call upon uh, Mr. Mudibedi Leboko to lead us with a she moment. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Tello. Uh, thank you, the visitors, uh, for coming to Palape and being with us for today for this event. Uh, the students, I welcome you as well to BUST. A brief uh, safety moment is to understand the uh, issues of uh, refreshments in terms of the bathroom for those who are not here. Our bathrooms for our elders there will be a bathroom here to your right when you exit and to the left when you exit. As for the general audience, we'll use the, bus, uh, the bathrooms just by the lobby, by the ATM that side. Security is there to guide us uh, to, the, to access those. Uh, we are not expecting or doing any training. So any form of alarm, be it from a mechanical or physical, even from a human being, understand it's real. Hence, you are going to need to evacuate. Uh, at the back there, it's our emergency doors. We'll just proceed and drop by the stairs. Also, security will guide. For those nearby, we'll use this uh, door to exit to our assembly point. Nonetheless, uh, rest assured, the clinic is around for any emergency situation to attend and stabilize. If need be, you will be transferred to the general hospital here in Palape. With that, I thank you. Th thank you very much, Ramudi Bedi. Um, we, we will try to run with our program so that uh, we can cover for the 35 minutes we've lost. And uh, I would like to now to call upon the Director for International Linkages and Partnerships, uh, Remu Leleke and introduce our guests. Remu Leleke. Thank you very much, Mr. Tello. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, very important peoples. And of course, I will start with myself. <laughs> um, my name is Michael Moleleke here. I'm the Director for International Linkages and Partnerships here at BUST. And I will proceed to introduce the, the landlord first. Professor Otlokos Totolo is the Vice Chancellor here at BUST. Uh, 
I have um, Professor Abram Atta Ogu, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research, Development and Innovation. I have Mr. Wawa Namunna Kotla, Deputy Director for Technology and Commercialization, representing the Permanent Secretary at the Minister of Communications, Knowledge and Technology. <clears throat> Mr. Tello has introduced himself, our Director for AVN SKA Project. I have Mr. Papi Somakwati, Director Legal Services. I have Member Tomu Kobi, Director Internal Audit. <clears throat> Dr. Dimane Mpueling, Project Lead for the Botswana Satellite Project. Dumelem <clears throat> Mangole, who is our Acting Director for Communications Public and Public Relations. Kenale Professor Shaden Masupe, Chief Executive Officer of the Botswana Institute of Technology, Research and Innovation, B3. Oh, is he? Oh, yes, he will come. And I have Me Ahudire Mapoka, Brand and Marketing Manager at Botswana Development Corporation. Kenale Me Rosemary Mudise who is the ACT Executive Coordinator in the Office of the VC. Kenale, Mr. Tepo Malefo, Senior Engineer at Botswana Fiber Network. Kenale, Dr. Tiroya Onetsukudu, who is the Acting Director for Innovation and Technology at the Botswana Digital and Innovation Hub. Right there. Kenale, Mr. Alec Nkomu, physics teacher at Lozani Senior Secondary School. <laughs> Mr. Alec Nkomu VC was my physics teacher at high school. <laughs> um, I was a pure science student. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, Things happened along the way. And then I, I will transition to introduce the members of the media houses here. There is a face I didn't take your name, so you'll uh, bear with me. I want to introduce you. Uh -huh. I have Mr. Shapat Dick, HR manager at Lukara Mining. <laughs> I have uh, members of staff and students from Bust. Clap for them. <laughs> I have um, students from Lotani Sina Secondary School. <laughs> And I have different representatives of media houses in Botswana. I will transition now and introduce our delegate, our, our guests from, from Thailand, from the National Astronomical Research, Research Institute of Thailand, Narit. And I will start with the executive director, Dr. Saran Poshia Chenda. The executive director is accompanied by his wife, Mrs. Bakamas Poshia Chinda. <laughs> there is the deputy director, Ms. Julada Kausad. <laughs> um, there is also Dr. Matipon Tam Matitam. Um, <laughs> who is the director of International Training Center in Astronomy at Narit under the auspices of UNESCO. And we have Ms. Superlak Chantawan. She's the head of foreign affairs at Narit. That was my list, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ramuleleke. Just to let you in the secret, 
when we were drafting the program, I was supposed to be the one doing the introductions. So when I looked at the same names for our team from Thailand, <laughs> suddenly I found a way of making him to do the one, <laughs> to be the one doing the, the introductions. But I think he did a very good job. Um, it looks like the... What, what is the name? I'm, I'm, I'm running into the problem I was, I was avoiding. <laughs> What is the name? I'm, I'm going to give you the mic. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Jess Sada Kirati Palat. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Nkomo, I was, I was a, a pure science student as well uh, from Lopsek. Uh, but unfortunately, I was not very good with languages. You can see that I, <laughs> I, don't even, I cannot even get the name of our colleague here. So I think we'll move on with the program. Um, I'm going to introduce somebody who is not uh, here in absentia. Uh, he is Professor Michael Bode. He is the man who made this everything possible. Uh, he instrumental in the development of astronomy in Botswana. And he, uh, upon realizing that there were people who were doing good things in astronomy, he provided the link between us and uh, Thailand. So um, he would have liked to be here, uh, but there were two reasons why he couldn't be here. One of them is on the account of ill health for, for the wife. So that's why he's not here, but uh, he would have been here as part of the, the event. With that said, I think we can continue with the program. And uh, I'm going to call upon Re Oabona Mongakota to deliver an opening remark. Re Mongakota, we can give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Director of Ceremonies. Um, it was quite a, a big list of people to acknowledge. And for fear of um, leaving out important people, I would want to say, let me ride on the existing protocol and only uh, acknowledge the presence of the VC as the host and the, the director, um, Pushi Achandan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing in for the Permanent Secretary from the Ministry of Communications, Knowledge and Technology, who could not make it to, to this gathering. Um, if you are near me, you'd see how trembling I am, because this is the first time I address a podium of this magnitude. But um, the easiest thing about it is that it's a speech that is written, and I'm just going to read it as it is. Thank you. Um, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I would like to officially welcome you to Palape. Um, it is a great one and privilege for me to address you on this momentous occasion of the MOU renewal between BUST and NARIT. This partnership marks a milestone in our journey towards enhancing astronomy in Botswana, and we are thankful for we are a thankful nation for it. As a country, our, our journey in astronomy began in, in earnest in 2011 with a declaration by the then Minister of Infrastructure, Science and Technology, Mr. Johnny Swartz, who at that time made, made sure that Botswana was part of the square kilometer array. And that decision led to a domino effect in events leading to the Botswana joining the race towards the development of astronomy. Since then, BUST in partnership with University of Botswana has spearheaded this initiative with BUST hosting the observatory and UB providing support through high performance computing facilities. 
Distinguished guests, it fills me with joy to witness the strides that we have, have been made by BUST to achieve the nation's vision. A few months ago, we witnessed the formation of yet other partnerships between BUST and international stakeholders to bring Botswana's first research grade, uh, research grade radio telescope into the country. Today marks yet another continuation of a relationship that Botswana has been able to make and benefiting from it. Our president's mindset change vision seeks to position Botswana as a nation that rapidly adapts to technological advancements by absorbing and applying new knowledge. This collaboration aligns perfectly with this vision as it enables us to leverage cutting edge astronomical research and technology to propel our economy, our country forward. By embracing this mindset, we aim to foster a culture of innovation and continuous learning that will drive our national development. Astronomy has the potential to significantly influence the economy of Botswana, much like it has done to Fonarit through the development of astrotourism. By promoting astronomy and leveraging on unique geographic advantages, we can attract tourists, researchers, and enthusiasts from around the world, thereby stimulating economic growth and creating new opportunities for our people. Additionally, we aim to whet the appetite of our younger generation for science and discovery, and by infusing indigenous astronomy with modern research, we seek to enhance the, culture, the cultural and educational experience of Botswana. In conclusion, Director of Ceremonies, I extend a warm welcome to the officials from NARIT. Your presence here is a, is a testament for, to our strong and growing partnership. We are grateful of your willingness to guide us in this journey. Your expertise and support are invaluable, and we look forward to continue our collaboration in many years to come. Please also heed our pleas for guidance and assistance as we navigate this existing path of discovery and innovation. Thank you all for being here today, and I look forward to witnessing the continued growth and success of this ex exceptional partnerships. Thank you, Pula. Uh, another big round of applause for Ramon Akhotla. Um, when I was doing the introductions, Dr. Saran, I, I forgot to mention why maybe we don't have a full house today. Uh, something happened yesterday that changed everything. Uh, we, you, you saw it. Oh, the VC uh, informed you. Yeah, we, we, we showed the world how we are made. And uh, the president thought everybody have to go and celebrate that. So that's why uh, the abuse community uh, have had, uh, had the plea from the president to go and celebrate the success in the 200. So that's why we, we, we don't have uh, a full house. But otherwise, I think we, we can continue with the program. I'm going to call upon uh, now the vice chancellor and talk about the Bust and Narit relationship. Uh, Prof. Totolo, a big round of applause for him. The director of ceremony, Re Komojo Telu, our visitors led by Dr. Saran, and that's where I'm going to stop because we, we are many, and I'll just say a protocol observed. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been given a warm welcome to this MOU renewal event that you have organized here at BUSD by Re Mungakhotla. Since its establishment in 2006, BUSD has been a transformative force leading Botswana's transition 
from a mineral-led to a knowledge economy through cutting-edge research in science, engineering, and technology. Part of that mandate led to Buse being appointed the custodian of astronomy project in Botswana, which quickly meant that strategic partnerships would need to be established with expert institutions like NARIT, among others. I've had the privilege of going to NARIT in Thailand and met uh, colleagues uh, at that institution. Bust and NARIT entered into an MOU on the 8th of August, 2018, through the signatures of myself and Dr. Saran, who is present here today. The objective for us was, and still is, to seek guidance and support in the development of astronomy in Botswana through student and staff exchanges. Narit, a giant in the field of astronomy, has provided us with invaluable support and expertise, enabling us to take our first steps with confidence and vision. Naris's journey in astronomy is a story of determination, excellence, and far-reaching impact. Established with a vision to propel the field of astronomy, Narit has grown into one of the to be one of the global leaders. From its humble beginnings, it has built state-of-the-art observatories, conducted groundbreaking research and fostered international collaborations that spans continents. Earlier on, you heard about uh, Michael Bode, uh, who is an active uh, participant, not only in astronomy development in Botswana, but uh, he also had his eyes on astronomy development uh, in Thailand. So uh, international collaborations have cut across uh, nations and continents uh, because of all these efforts. Today, NARIT stand at the forefront of astronomical research, pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and inspiring future generations of scientists. I will let Dr. Sharon to describe our growth uh, in his uh, presentation uh, this afternoon. In the first phase of this MOU, Botswana has greatly benefited from NARIS guidance and support. Some of our postgraduate students have had the opportunity to gain practical experience at NARIS during and after their studies. I had a privilege once again to meet them when I was in Thailand. Very enthusiastic young people, hungry uh, for knowledge and having uh, the privilege uh, to be supervised by some of the best uh, academics uh, researchers in the world. This hands-on exposure has been instrumental in shaping their careers and contributing to the growth of our national expertise in astronomy. Furthermore, NARIT has been a pivotal partner in our vision to establish Botswana's first Astro Park at Beust. Can't wait to have that Astro Park after being inspired uh, by Narit and Thailand. This ambitious project, which includes an observatory with a research grade telescopes and a planetarium, will be a beacon of scientific research and grassroots level astronomy education in our country. Whenever you have an Astro Park, you can see people coming from all over the country visiting this uh, facility, whether it is the observatory or the planetarium. Many young people, enthusiasts, and I can't wait to have that type of uh, setup uh, here in Botswana. Uh, it will be it will be a, a crowd pulling activity. Uh, Palape will change, the whole of Botswana will change 
uh, because of the establishment of an Astro Park. Nari's expertise has been crucial in planning and proposing this landmark initiative. Narit has also played a significant role in enhancing our outreach activities. They have shared their knowledge on effective outreach activities, enabling our staff to reach a wider audience and inspire Botswana to take an interest in astronomy. In, in Setuana, there is a way we observe the skies. All these things are astronomy, if you didn't know. And, and Botswana have got a way of expressing what they mean if they see Kupadi Lalelo, if they see Mpatalatsani, if they see other formations in the firmament. They have got a way of interpreting what they see. Therefore, a traditional a knowledge on astronomy is key. It's, it's a rock bed, if you like. It's a foundation of us understanding more of uh, these things. As we look to the future, the renewal of this uh, MOU signifies our continued commitment to this uh, fruitful partnership. Apart from this renewal ceremony, Narit will be joining our astronomy team for the National Science Month campaign through conducting workshops with our students and staff donating telescopes for outreach purposes and joining our staff in carrying out some of the Science Month activities leading towards the National Science Week in the end of this month. This ongoing collaboration is a testament to the productivity and continuous benefit that our relationship with NARIT has fostered. In closing, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude For the person for, for the vice chancellor. Uh, uh, okay. Should I give you the mic to do that? No, you can have you don't it. Okay. The, 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 yeah. the vice chancellor is going to be giving Dr. Farah <laughs> some gifts. Okay. Can we wait for that? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We now have the MOU renewed. <clears throat> um, would you like to say something yes. on the MOU? Okay. Um, I'll give Dr. Saran to uh, say a few uh, on the MOU, then he'll be followed by uh, the Vice Chancellor. Whoa. Mr. Vice Chancellor, Executives, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to be here today. This is my first time in Botswana. Thank you. Actually, we've 
we've been working together for many years, as uh, Mr. VC mentioned in, in his uh, speech earlier. And uh, a, f a few years ago, we also hosted uh, a training uh, of uh, two of your students for a couple of years. Yeah, I, I hope they enjoyed it. Anyway, uh, Botswana and Thailand, even though we're very far apart in different continents, we share several similarities. Uh, I think the GDP per capita is very similar indeed. The only difference is that we have 65 million people instead of uh, fewer than three, 3 million. And the size of the country, actually, uh, Botswana, slightly larger than Thailand for the area, right? Anyway, uh, we we so glad uh, that we, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we work with you uh, on several things and we share our vision and goal. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you're part of the SKA now. We, we're working with the SKA as well, even though we're not a full member yet, because uh, getting into the SKA is quite expensive for us. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we're working with uh, uh, radio astronomy. Uh, and we, we've now got uh, large uh, radio scopes in the in the country. That's why I like to show you a few slides. And my, my talk ac is actually uh, the introduction of NARIT. Uh, why I'm here, this is part of our uh, trip uh, to southern part of Africa. Yesterday we were in Cape Town uh, uh, participating in the uh, IAU, International Astronomical Union General Assembly uh, meeting in Cape Town. And uh, we, we were invited uh, to give a speech as well because we now recognized uh, by the IAU as one of the uh, world leaders in uh, public outreach and public engagement. Actually, I'd like to show you a few slides so that you, you, I'd like to convince you that uh, astronomy is not far away from everyday life. You know, as a uh, a developing country very similar to Botswana you know in in most developing countries uh, policy makers politicians and stakeholders of often consider astronomy as something very far away from everyday life uh, in fact it's much closer than you think astronomy uh, is one of the best to, uh, to inspire the younger generations. I'm sure that if you ask young kids anywhere in, in Botswana, if they like to see Saturn through a telescope, they'll uh, say yes. Uh, that's one thing. So, uh, and, 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 you know, it's uh, not only about uh, in inspiration and, and uh, uh, scientific mind that you can create uh, for the young kids, but also astronomy. If you look in the history uh, over the few the past few decades or past several decades, astronomy played a very important role in the technology that you're using nowadays. Because uh, astronomy happens to be uh, the frontier science that demands the highest uh, technology available to mankind. And many of them not available on shelf. You probably you can buy or you can uh, hire a company to design a telescope. But if you want to strive forward in astronomy, you need to invest and develop your own team, your engineers, to be as capable as possible uh, to produce technologies in the fields of, for example, optics and photonics, uh, microwave technology, because you're doing uh, uh, the SKA, mechatronics, because most of the instruments are robots nowadays, software engineers, of course. And if you uh, know uh, astronomy happened to be uh, the field that uh, started to make use of uh, AI and data analytics uh, several decades ago. Even in your mobile phone, for example, uh, 
you, you will find many innovations uh, from astronomy, including the digital camera, Wi-Fi, also a, a, a pattern, a copyright of a, a pattern of a... Hmm? Using this microphone? Or standing close to the podium, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Wi-Fi also the development uh, in, uh, from astronomy as well as many uh, medical instruments that make use of, uh, for example, aperture synthesis uh, technique uh, from astronomy that won the Nobel Prize in 1976. That's why if you uh, ask whether you need to be rich before you can start doing astronomy, I write to uh, ask you otherwise. That maybe you have to do it so that you will get rich. That's why astronomy is so important. And, and that's uh, the philosophy at NARIT. We look at astronomy uh, as a challenge that drives human capacity and technology developments. And at NARIT, uh, we now have more than 300 staff uh, not only in the headquarters in the northern part of Thailand, but scattered around the country, operating uh, public observatories. But out of those 340 uh, people working at the institute, more than 100 are engineers, even more than astronomers themselves. We have around 33 PhDs in astronomy, in astrophysics, and maybe 15 to 20 uh, postdocs doing astrophysics, cosmology, and other related fields, but still far fewer than, than the number of engineers working at the institute. Yeah, that's the beginning. So I'd like to show a few slides uh, here, uh, what, what we do uh, at NARIT. So if you are keen to come to visit us, uh, we uh, welcome you all. Uh, many of you in, in this auditorium already been to NARIT. And we a very young organization. Uh, we've, we've been a full research institute for only uh, 15 years, even, even though we started uh, to plan uh, for our first observatory on the summit of the highest mountain in Thailand, uh, more than 20 years ago. And it took us many years to convince uh, the stakeholders that uh, we have to seriously invest and develop astronomy in the country. Those of you sitting in the back can move forward uh, so that you can see the screen more clearly. I know as a student, I, I used to sit in the back as well. <laughs> I was a back room boy. And I have to thank Mr. Vice Chancellor as well as the staff here at BIUS. Uh, and also uh, Professor Michael Board uh, from Liverpool John Moore. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that's why we need engineers. <laughs> Finally, we overcome the technology. Anyway, uh, good to have the slide, so it's a lot easier to talk. Well, before I uh, continue my talk, first of all, I forgot to mention that uh, in Thailand, uh, we have very long names, and we recognize each other by just the first name. Uh, some say that you know the Thai people. You you can you can tell that they're Thai people from the look. They look like Chinese, but have Indian names, for example. <laughs> most most of our names are Sanskrit, uh, ancient language in India. Well, uh, we quite different from university. We research institute and uh, the.
Can you see the cursor on the screen? Yeah. This is the focal point uh, of most of the research infrastructure. But university uh, focuses on more like, you know, uh, publications and uh, exploratory uh, responsive uh, research. But we, as a national institute, we have to focus more on uh, preparing the infrastructure for the researchers, both from university and other institutes in the country. Uh, so our main focus probably different, but we have to work together. Yeah. This is what, what I just uh, explained that uh, at NARIT we have this philosophy. We look at astronomy as a challenge that drives human capacity and technology developments. And we uh, have several missions at NARIT. Like I mentioned earlier, and also that's why we're here this week, in, we, we, we were in Cape Town a few days ago, a couple of days ago, uh, to receive the outreach development and education prize from the IAU. And we recognize that one of the uh, leaders in the world in the field of uh, public outreach and engagement. Uh, if you look at the three uh, first uh, missions, we do research very similar to universities here and anywhere else in the world. Uh, but the second one is something that I like to focus on as well. You, you can't, you know, uh, afford to not to do this. You have to develop technology yourselves because many things not available in the market. And what makes NARIT different from other research institutes and universities is that we have a very big, a very extensive uh, program of public outreach. We engage with hundreds of thousands of people every year very closely uh, through several activities, actually hundreds of activities all year round. That's why, uh, the, and, and because we have to focus on uh, engineering, advanced engineering work, the largest team uh, at NARIT is engineers. We also welcome uh, foreign uh, researchers and engineers. And, and those are the numbers of, uh, from outside of Thailand. The average age uh, for people at NARIT is quite young. This is because a few years ago we started an uh, aerospace uh, program uh, trying to develop our own capability in space technology. And we recruited many young aerospace engineers uh, from uh, all over the country. And most of them are younger than 30 years old. That's why the average age of NARIT is quite low. Our budget hasn't grown so much over the past few years because of COVID. But the next fiscal year, uh, we're going to surpass approximately 35 million US dollars uh, for the budget of the institute. Our fiscal year in so we will begin a new fiscal year. And this is the summary of our infrastructure, uh, both in Thailand and outside the country. Uh, we operate uh, the largest optical and radio telescopes in South Asia. The optical one is on the uh, summit of uh, the highest mountain in the country at 2,450 meters above the sea level. That's because you, uh, you should look at high altitudes for optical uh, astronomy due to the fact that the at atmosphere uh, absorbs light and plays a very big part in creating uh, what we call astronomical seeing. Uh, but for the case of radio astronomy, you need to have a location that is radio quiet. So our radio telescope located in a valley surrounded by mountains, not far from the second largest city, uh, Chiang Mai, where we are to protect the uh, telescope from radio frequency interference. And these five pictures show our uh, public 
observatories across the country. They decide uh, to accommodate uh, students, the general public, and amateur astronomers. Thank you. Who come to engage in most of our activities. And down below here, these are the pictures taken from our telescopes outside the country. The first one being the one at Solo Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. This one in uh, California in the Sierra uh, Nevada mountain. This one is the highest altitude optical telescope that we've got in China as 3,200 meters above the sea level in Lijiang province, in Yunnan province, close to uh, the city of Lijiang. And the last one in Australia, uh, just outside of the fence of a uh, siding spring observatory. These are the pictures of our national infrastructure, the 2.4 meter uh, and one meter uh, optical telescope in Thailand. And the right hand side is a 40 meter uh, radio telescope. This is much larger than most of the SKA uh, dishes. That's because uh, it, it, is de de it was designed to work as a single dish as well as a uh, uh, join, joining VLBI networks. Uh, in the case of SKA, uh, most of the ditches are smaller, but together, hundreds of ditches working together, much, much more powerful than this one. And it's, it, it will be something that we're looking uh, to work with, as well as uh, looking at possibility uh, to be a full member of the SKA, but you were lucky because you host the second phase of the SKA here. But because we don't, uh, we're not going to do this. Uh, Thailand uh, is not a good site uh, for the SKA. If we to join it as a full member, we might have to pay around two million euros a year just to be part of it. This is the picture of the 40 meter. You look at the size, about half of the football field. And people standing in there look very small. Apart from the 40 meter uh, telescope uh, at the same site, just outside the city of Chiang Mai, there's a second uh, radio telescope, uh, the, four, the 13 meter, uh, we, we successfully installed a few months ago. This will be part of uh, what we call uh, the IVS network for geodesy and astrometry because radio astronomy happens to be the best technique uh, for monitoring plate tectonic movements. Some plate tectonics that move very slowly, like a millimeter, a few millimeters a year, cannot be detected with other techniques like GPS. But if you use uh, if you perform very long baseline in the volumetric observation with similar telescopes around the world, you know the exact position to the precision of microns depending on uh, the wavelength uh, you, you, you work, you're working with. That's why this, is, this happens to be the most accurate technique uh, for monitoring uh, the plate tectonic movements as well as uh, Earth orientation parameters. You probably think that the rotation of the Earth uh, and also the movement around the orbit around the Sun uh, are constant, but actually they're not. There may be some variations that cannot be detected beneath with any other techniques apart from radio astronomy. And this is our collaboration with the Shanghai Astronomical Observatory in China. And there are going to be more telescopes uh, in this network in Thailand. This is the picture of the two telescopes side by side outside of Chiang Mai. We have a plan to install more radio telescope. There will be another one in the far south. So the separation between uh, the northern uh, the Chiang Mai station and the Songkla station is around 1,300 uh, kilometers. I forgot to mention that in radio astronomy, it is possible, you know, 
Normally, when, when you want to resolve uh, objects that are close together, the resolution of the telescope depends upon the wavelength divided by the diameter of the telescope. In optical telescopes, the largest one available to mankind right now for a single telescope is only 10 meter. The European Southern Observatory uh, is building the largest uh, telescope to be installed in Chile. That's 39 meter. But in radio astronomy, you can perform this very long baseline inter in interferometry by combining data collected from different sites at the same time. If you observe the same object at the same time, you use mathematical uh, procedure that we call uh, correlation. And the result that you get is similar to you use the telescope uh, of a size of the separation between the two sites. That's why we like to create our own uh, VRBI network, or TVN. But, but you, it, that, that's not necessary uh, for the beginning, because right now we're part of uh, the East Asian Observatory, working with Japan, uh, China, Korea, Taiwan, and also the European VR, VR, VRBI network. And we're looking to join uh, the large, uh, the long baseline uh, in the flowmeter uh, with Australia and New Zealand as well. Uh -huh. Why I'm not talking about the US? Because we haven't got common sky with the US. We're on the opposite side. Uh, in order to join VRBI, you need common sky. In other words, uh, you've got to be able to observe the same object in the sky at the same time. At NARIT, we also accommodate uh, very good uh, high performance computing. Uh, with uh, 1,600 CPU cores and a bunch of uh, GPUs. The next fiscal year, we're going to get uh, funding uh, to more than double the capability of our HPC. Uh, this is the timeline of the development from the telescope above and uh, some technology development. We now part of the so-called Cherenkov Telescope Array uh, with many European, uh, US, uh, and Japan, many European countries, US and Japan. But if you look at the technology, we start from developing control system, mirror coding machine, many spectrographs, and radio receivers. And these technologies can be shared with the industry. And it, one of the best uh, breeding ground uh, to train our engineers. This, is, this shows the research output from uh, our 33 researchers plus postdocs. Last calendar year, we managed to publish 75 papers. Sorry, this slides in Thai. Well, we discover many things, including uh, more than 13 uh, exoplanets or planets outside of the solar system by our team. Three years ago, we discovered uh, a new moon of this 130 uh, Electra asteroid uh, by using our own algorithm to analyze all data observed by telescopes in Chile, and we found the third moon. Uh, we also, nowadays, you know, you don't even have to, don't need to have your own large telescope. You can start research right away by making use of research data uh, that available. Uh, for example, data from the James Webb Space Telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as uh, from many other ground-based uh, large telescopes. And last year, we part of this uh, very uh, uh, distinct, uh, yeah, fantastic publication, discovering a new class of object, and published in Nature in November last year. We also work on archaeo astronomy because there are so many ancient temples in Thailand, thousands of years old. And we found several uh, secrets. Uh, 
or develop or, or the knowledge of uh, our ancestors uh, thousands of years ago, uh, especially the alignment uh, of the ancient temples to constellations, to stars, and lots of other things. This is the area of the technology we're working on uh, from optics, space system, radio frequency, mirror recording, as well as advanced manufacturing. And these are the pictures of the technology coming out of our labs uh, in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Uh, from spectrographs, chronograph, modern telescope. And we're proud of this one as well. This is the first hyperspectral imaging payload that's going to be launched into space on board our own uh, TSC-1 satellite. In advanced mechanical manufacturing, we're focusing on making mechanical parts as accurate as five micron. And we can do this routinely now. This is crucial if you want to do advanced engineering. You've got to be able to design and manufacture your own mechanical parts as well. You can't rely on the industry. This is not unique for NARIT. Even in Germany, in the US, you know, the, the industry uh, would prefer to produce uh, maybe less accurate, but thousands of uh, pieces of uh, parts. But for research, sometimes you want to produce just one complicated part that very difficult to manufacture. A good example is this uh, auto mode a transducer, which might have, have cost us more than 10,000 US dollar if we were to import uh, uh, from outside of Thailand. But we can now do this uh, in our labs very easily. This is the pictures of our uh, 3U CubeSat that we managed to design and build within just one year, waiting to be launched into space by a Japanese rocket uh, from Wakayama this uh, November, hopefully. In the beginning, uh, we didn't have capability uh, to design and build our own uh, radio receivers. The best thing to do in astronomy is to send people uh, to work with the more experienced institutes. In this case, uh, the upper pictures, these two, the L-band and the K-band receivers, were designed and built by the engineers at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Germany, but we sent our engineers uh, to work with them and learn and train there. But right now, I'm glad to say that so many radio or microwave receivers, including the C-band, X-band, the Q-band, and the W-band being designed and built at home. This is a nice picture of uh, something we're proud of as well. Early this year, if you remember, there was a big news of this spacecraft this time to the moon, but it wasn't successful. It entered the Earth's atmosphere, and we used our telescope with our own software to control, to track it successfully during the entry into the atmosphere. This is another project that we're going to be completed Okay. The real engineer has arrived. <laughs> oh, good. Fantastic. Thank you very much. This is the 
the project we're taking on right now, because you know, uh, if you remember, I, I told you about our public observatories as well as uh, observatories uh, or telescopes installed outside of the country. They are uh, those telescopes we procured from the US, a 70 centimeter or 0.7 meter telescopes uh, from a company in the US. But I'm glad to say that from now on, we decided not to buy anymore. This is the 0.8 meter we're building right now, and it will be completed uh, before the end of next year for our upcoming uh, public observatory in the lower part of the north of Thailand. I did not mention to you that we're working not only in astronomy, we're also working on atmospheric science. And this one uh, is the atmospheric LIDAR we managed to design and build last year, and it's working very well now. It's a combination of a pulse laser and a telescope to collect the scatter light. And that way you can identify the level of aerosol uh, from the ground. I, I saw on the way here, you've got a lot of aerosol too, uh, PM2.5. Uh, yes, and this is the technique that is used to monitor uh, the, what we call the mixing height, uh, how high the level of aerosol goes up to. And from our own lab, we managed to design and build. We already patented it. This is the use of our own low resolution spectrograph and a picosecond pulse laser. This combination can be used to uh, use in a technique uh, called time resolve uh, Raman spectroscopy, uh, especially for some colored samples. And this one, uh, uh, we 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 using it to identify uh, the chemical called calcium oxalate uh, that would become kidney stone for medical applications and many more things. I'm continuing to outreach, as I mentioned earlier, that we received uh, the outreach uh, uh, prize. The ODE in outreach uh, from the IAU uh, on Tuesday in Cape Town, and we recognize as one of the leading institutes in public outreach and engagement. Last calendar year alone, we uh, hosted uh, close to 700,000 uh, people at all our sites combined. But mind you, our population uh, 65 million. But that's already about 1% of the Thai population. But looking at the growth here, which is very steep, like an exponential growth, this year we expect to host close to 1 million people. And it, it will soon surpass 1 million every calendar year from the activities uh, and the, you know, uh, uh, the the outreach that we, uh, the outreach activities that we performing every year, and December last year, uh, we organized possibly the largest gathering of people in on a single night for stargazing in Bangkok, with twelve thousand five hundred people joining. Yes, and on Saturday nights, people can come to or our public observatories across the country to, to do stargazing. And this has created a lot of excitement and, and enthusiasm among younger generations, a lot. And this is what we're going to do tonight and tomorrow night, right? Yeah. And the number of return visits by people to our public observatories is quite high. More than 25% of them return or come back to do stargazing with us more than five times. This is our headquarters in Chiang Mai. And those two uh, students from Botswana spend their time here for two years. This is the, uh, well, the, the, yeah, not satellite image. We use a drone to take this. Uh, we have 
laboratories and, and offices, as well as public observatory and a medium-sized planetarium there. These are the pictures of our uh, five regional observatories for the public. The fifth one being built in Pistolog. And we're planning for phase two and phase three of the public observatories so that we can cover the whole, the entire population of Thailand. At each of the sites, uh, we decide and build our own interactive media. Most of this designed by our team and manufactured uh, in the province, I mean in Chiang Mai, Thailand. I like to skip this. The planetarium that we chose to have, uh, very affordable indeed. We didn't choose to use uh, optomechanical uh, projectors that are very expensive. This is uh, the full digital uh, projector, uh, making use of the technology called digital mapping, and very affordable, very cheap. But the problem a few years ago was that we didn't have the software to show the pictures or the image of the stars on the screen, on the hemispherical screen. So Mr. Matipon had the development. And now we are uh, proud to uh, say that we got this state-of-the-art uh, software uh, used at all our planetariums, as well as a mobile version. It's not a complete version yet, it's a still a better version, but uh, they can all download. Yeah. And the software is called NAPA Star Map. NAPA stands for NARIT, Astronomical Planetarium Applications, as well as Mr. Mati, Dr. Matipon's daughter name. <laughs> NAPA in Thai means sky. These are the pictures of the uh, Star gazing events on Saturday nights, you probably wonder what about the weekdays? Yeah. The weekends on Saturdays is available for general public, but on weekdays we often have schools that come to do star gazing. And many years ago we launched this uh, project uh, to distribute 10 inch Dobsonian telescopes to schools in Thailand. The telescope uh, was designed by an amateur astronomer in Thailand and made in Bangkok. We sent, we shipped to two of them here, right? And we're going to use this, uh, uh, those two telescopes to show you uh, the objects tonight. There'll be a crescent moon, right? That's where Saturn. These are the accessories of the uh, telescope. Two years ago, we launched another project to distribute uh, cardboard planetariums uh, to schools. We didn't uh, ship uh, the cardboard <coughs> here, but we sent this hemispherical uh, projector to you so that with uh, an, an instruction, you can build your own cardboard planetarium here in Botswana. And using just uh, a normal uh, projector uh, to show the picture of the sky uh, with a freeware called Stellarium. We also provide support to uh, people with disabilities, including the blind, the deaf, the autism, and the elderly. A few years ago, we uh, published a dictionary uh, of uh, astro uh, words in astronomy uh, for the deaf. A couple of months ago, <laughs> thank you. A couple of months ago, we also organized activities for children with autism in Bangkok. Actually, we've done that many times. And the project uh, that we do for the blind uh, is something very proud of. Uh, and we've done this many times, including bringing the blind students 
uh, to the very top uh, of uh, the mountain in Thailand to look through telescope. You probably wonder why we, you know, uh, we set up telescopes for the blind. Uh, we were told by the teachers that 70% of the blind students can still see some light. And it happened, and I was so surprised that many of them could distinguish between the brightness of the moon and the light from planet Saturn, even though the, they didn't see the image clearly. I'd like to show you a short video of this uh, activity called Astronomy Camp uh, for Children and Adolescents with Visual Impairments. leave no one behind. Well, this is another project uh, we've been doing for a few years. We're campaigning uh, for dark sky, to preserve the dark sky in the country. Try, if you look uh, at the light pollution map uh, from NASA, for example, the whole of Thailand is very bright right now uh, because of the use, ex extensive use of uh, outdoor lighting, including on the highways. Uh, well. Why we have to do this? First of all, you think about upward lighting into the sky. That's a waste of energy, right? If you just design uh, with some simple light fixture, trying to keep the light down, you can reduce the wattage of the light bulb. That way you save a lot of energy. And secondly, you all probably cannot sleep when it's very bright, right? Because by nature, uh, both flora and fauna evolve on the, this planet uh, with night and day. And the third reason is for astro-tourism. Because younger generations, people nowadays, looking for something very different. They, some of them never want to go to shopping malls anymore. There's so many shopping malls in Thailand. Uh, or to the beaches. Uh, they're looking for something very different. So we, we're promoting astro tourism with the Tourism Authority of Thailand, because Thailand is a big tourism uh, place, country. We, we've got uh, foreign visitors this year. We expect to have 40 million. Last year, Bangkok was the most visited city in the world, for example. And up to today, we have approved 48 uh, dark sky sites include national parks, resorts, and communities. So this is very important. And it's become part of the highlight that the International Astronomical Union, and as well as uh, one organization under the UN called UNUSA, trying to campaign for to reduce uh, the upward lighting into the sky understand that Botswana is still very dark. So if you plan in advance, uh, you can prevent the sky getting brighter and brighter, especially 
uh, with this LED revolution. For our, for our uh, social media, we have a very big follower on our Facebook page. Uh, I'm not asking you to uh, press the like button because it's in Thai language, unless you want to read the translation. But it's now followed by 700,000 people, the highest among research institutes in the world. This is a collaboration with so many countries. There's a Botswana flag there. And the big names uh, in, the, in the field of astronomy and space we're working with very closely, including the SKA. We are a full member of the so-called East Asian Observatory with China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And the telescope that we operate uh, on Monarchia called James Clerk Maxwell. James Clerk Maxwell uh, built by the UK, but now managed by the EAO because the UK lack funding uh, for this telescope. Uh, it's on Monarchia and is part of the so-called Event Horizon Telescope that took the first image of black hole. We now member, a full member of uh, the project called Juno or Jingmen Underground Neutrino Observatory, one of the best neutrino observatory in the world in Guangdong uh, province, China. Uh, it's being built uh, 700 meters below ground with state-of-the-art detectors. We designed and built a magnetic coil to shield geomagnetic magnetic field in order to increase the sensitivity of the detectors. And I mentioned to you that we're part of the Chenkov Telescope Array. We uh, <coughs> contribute one of the best uh, mirror coding machine, uh, making use of sputtering technique. Uh, the design is unique because the, the, the problem is that in the CTA project, there are more than 6,000 mirrors mirrors of about one meter or so size that need to be recorded every once in a while. And we have, we, they, they're looking for a solution uh, from member countries and they chose us to provide this solution and the machine will be shipped uh, to Chile in a few years time. Before I end uh, my talk, I'd like to mention a little bit about uh, our Thai Space Consortium. We the core of this team in Thailand, uh, together with many institutes, including universities, uh, the Synchrotron Light Research Institute of Thailand, and many more. This is our roadmap. Uh, a few years ago, we sent our engineers uh, to work uh, in Changchun, China, to train on building this uh, satellite, the TSC Part Fighter. We are now working on this. TSC-1 in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And uh, the engineering model uh, is going to be uh, assembled uh, this uh, October in our clean room. And I told you about this uh, Narit Cube 1, that's a demonstration uh, satellite to prove that the parts that designed in, were designed in Narit and fabricated uh, in our old labs will work in space. And we're working with uh, a Chinese CNSA closely uh, to send our satellite to orbit the moon in the next few years as well. This is the Narit Cube 1, tested successfully uh, in QTEC uh, Japan last year, going to be launched this November. This is a TSC 1 satellite that we're designing. Uh, Purely uh, designed and made in Thailand. In 2026, this will be on board the Chang'e 7 uh, spacecraft to orbit the moon. This is a cosmic ray detector we designed and built. Uh, already accepted, we have to deliver the flight model before the end of this year. Now, our people. Uh, 
uh, our engineers working in China to test this. This is because we still lack some testing facilities uh, for uh, lunar uh, spacecraft, which is different from the low Earth orbit. For example, the uh, radio, the high radiation uh, outside of the Van Allen belt, and yeah, we like to, uh, you know, and also because this is just a payload or an instrument on board uh, Chang'e 7, it needs to be compatible and integrated to the uh, spacecraft. Yeah, and, and hopefully in 2028, this lunar part fighter, a 20 kilogram, 12 unit of such uh, CubeSat, will uh, orbit the moon, uh, be uh, sent uh, together with uh, Chang'e 8 spacecraft. And we have a plan to design and build our own 300 kilogram uh, lunar orbiter, uh, and and hopefully this will be sent uh, to the moon in the next few years. Already we've got a pledge from a big energy drink company, Red Bull. You know Red Bull, right? Yeah. Red Bull is owned by a Thai family. Many people were surprised. Yeah, even Red Bull in Europe and the U.S. is still 51% owned by this Thai family. They already pledged about three million U.S. dollar for this project. And that ends my talk. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. VC and the executives here uh, and the staff for inviting me here. It's an exciting time. I'm looking forward to the next few days in Botswana. Thank you very much. Um, we, because we are not doing well for time, um, Dr. Saran will be at the stargazing. He's going to take uh, some questions from you. Uh, Mati Pon here will be able to take some of the questions. Just for the benefit of the students, uh, I'm just going to take two uh, questions from the students. Uh, the adults will ask the questions at the stargazing. Uh, so with that, by show of hands, students, because you won't be part of us at the stargazing. I'm just going to take two questions from the students. Um, anybody to pass the mics to the students? Or there's only one mic, student? Anybody with a question for Dr. Saran? Um, my name is Marang. I'm a Form 4 student at Lausanne. And my question is that, like, since there are so many countries who are, which are sending satellites in the, into space, I was wondering if, like, how does it work? Because there are so many satellites that are being sent into space. It's not just Thailand. Obviously, other countries are sending satellites. Like, is it territorial? Does each country has, ha, have each, its own territory? Or I'd, I just wanted to know how it works. Thank you. Yeah, you can pass the mic to the other one. If there is a third one, we can take a third question. OK. Um, Pema Lefa Poli from MACE, SSS, from four student. So I just wanted to ask if they also study alien existentialism. That's my question. The, the question is whether you study aliens. The existence I'll, I'll of aliens. Answer <laughs> okay. Then the third question from there was another hand there. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lamini Tina. I'm a Form 4 from Latin SSS. So I, I had a curiosity that. There's this, I don't know if it's a speculation, I want to confirm it, that 
the issue about global warming on Earth, right? Uh, is it true that uh, you guys are researching for a suitable place outside our planet to settle in, like in case something goes wrong with uh, Earth? <laughs> and also, <laughs> another one, you say that your lunar orbiter, uh, it's orbiting around the moon, that's what you're planning on, or it's, it's already happening. I'm sorry if I didn't hear well. Uh, I, I got, I, some time ago, I passed some information saying that the moon is slowly drifting away from the Earth. I wanted to conf uh, con confirm if that's correct. And also, since you guys are going to be sending this lunar orbiter, what are you doing to prevent this? Or <laughs> do you have any plan to save us? Because it's dangerous if the moon orbits. So yeah, that's my, my two questions. Thank you very much. Um, as we answer the questions, Matipo, I want to uh, recognize the presence amongst us for the uh, chairperson of the Astronomical Society of Botswana, Prof. Modisi. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think you can between yourself and Matipo and answer the question. <laughs> Well, uh, Maripon is very good on answering uh, the last couple of questions, but I'd like to answer the first question first. I, I remember correctly, uh, asking about the territory in space, right? I mean, sending spacecraft or, or satellites. For low Earth orbit, uh, that's no control. Anyone can send or can launch a satellite to the low Earth orbit. By low Earth orbit, talking about the orbit above the surface of the Earth, uh, from about 100 uh, to uh, 1,000 1, kilometers. There's no control. That's why we worried a lot. Because in the future, for example, if you heard about the SpaceX uh, project uh, called uh, Starlink, they will soon uh, launch tens of thousands of uh, CubeSat this size into space for internet. Uh, telecommunication. That's worrying indeed. And in the future, it might be uh, difficult to launch uh, the satellite into space further without colliding with each other. But, but space is huge anyway. If you, if, if you look at uh, the surface of the Earth, each of the satellites is smaller than a car. But again, on, on Earth, we have uh, hundreds of millions of cars. Uh, at, at different countries. But anyway, because in space, most of the satellites uh, orbit around the Earth very fast indeed. Even just uh, a boat or a nut uh, that, came, that came out of a satellite, you know, when hitting another satellite, it's like you're shooting with a cannon. And if that happens, you create thousands more uh, debris. Uh, that would be difficult for uh, astronaut or for other satellites to go into space. But there's a, an orbit, the so-called orbit, that is called geosynchronous orbit at 36,000 kilometers from the surface. That is, uh, you know, many countries have got a, a location uh, or slot within that orbit above the equator. Why? Because if you launch uh, a satellite into that orbit, for example, above the longitude of Botswana, it orbits the Earth at the same speed as the Earth rotates around itself. In other words, it stays uh, stationary in the sky. That's why when you uh, watch a satellite TV, you don't need to, uh, to track or to turn the, the, the satellite dish to follow uh, the satellite because it's almost stationary above uh, the equator. That's called a geosynchronous orbit. And that's very limited, very narrow uh, path uh, in the sky. And uh, that orbit is controlled by the so-called ITU, or International Telecommunication Union. And each country has got some allocation. For example, Thailand has got two slots. I don't, I don't remember the detail of uh, what longitude, but. I think Botswana has got one as well. The second question about what? Alien? 
Before I, I, I pass on the microphone to Mati, Dr. Matipon, I'd like to mention that we joining uh, uh, the SETI, one of the SETI projects. SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, called Breakthrough, trying to listen if there's any radio waves that come from uh, distant objects that are uh, not natural, for example. And this is laid by, this project is laid by University of Berkeley in the US. What else? I think uh, the second part of this question, as well as the, the last question, so it should be answered by Dr. Matipon, please. All right, thank you. Lo First of all, as a person who worked closely with the science communication, I'd like to remark that I'm really impressed by the questions that you students have asked. Um, unfortunately for Thailand, um, the current um, um, classroom structures doesn't really allow for students to ask questions, and this is a problem we work with a lot. And I'm really... Um, Getting our students to ask more questions is something that we're really working really hard on. And uh, we think asking questions is the first stage to, asking good questions, being curious, is really the very first important step. And if your students are already asking these many good questions, I have but very good hopes for your future. So um, a lot of applause for all the questions. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, so with the, with the aliens, yes. Um, so the general consensus is the universe is a really, really big place, right? And this also ties to the next question of uh, whether we're looking for somewhere else to live if um, you know, the global warming is making Earth uninhabitable. Um, let me do this very simple analogy. Imagine we shrink the sun to the size of a soccer ball, okay? And then the universe is filled with soccer balls, right? The next star will be another soccer ball. Can you guess how far away the next soccer ball has to be? Like outside the gate of the abuse to South Africa? Is that too far? The answer is probably somewhere in Europe. That's how far you have to walk from this one soccer ball until you find the next one. So whether you like it or not, this is the only place we have for a long, long time. We're not going to get to anywhere really quickly. And in this scale, by the way, in this scale, the side of the side of a soccer ball, the farthest distance any man has ever traveled is about this big. That's the distance to the moon. And it took them three days. So we're not going anywhere for a while. <laughs> but also, this also means space is big, right? But it also much bigger than that. It has, has trillions and trillions of all the soccer balls in the sky. And each of these, we now know that probably most of these have some planets orbiting around it. Planets come different sizes. So there's probably a lot of planets that are about the right size, and a lot of planets that are rocky. So we are pretty sure some of these planets are probably capable of hosting life. Now whether some of them already has life on them, that is something we're, we haven't discovered yet. But uh, many people are thinking it's just a matter of time before we find them. And we're looking, but we haven't had any concrete evidence that they exist or have visited us yet. But one of the field that uh, actually one of our researchers is doing is looking for planets. First, if there's an alien life form out there, they probably live on a planet. So first bet is looking for their homes. So this is why we recall, uh, you heard uh, earlier, we look for exoplanets, planets ex orbiting around, um, the, around other stars besides the suns. Um, about 20, 30 years ago, the number of exoplanets we have discovered was zero. This is a really new field. Now we have discovered more than four or 5,000 exoplanets. And this is a really new emerging field. And uh, with, when you guys grow up, we're going to be tens of thousands. We're going to find exoplanets everywhere. And many of these are going to be more and more interesting, more and more chance of finding life. And eventually, you'll probably find some signs of life in the future. And um, so that was two of the questions. What was the other one? Quickly. 
I, th I think there was some more questions that I have an answer. What was the last one? The moon drifting away, yes. Well, the moon is drifting away, but it drifts about, about an inch every um, year, I think. Um, there's nothing you can do about it, period. The, one of the reasons the moon is drifting is because of tidal force. If you live near the ocean, um, probably a little difficult around here. <laughs> but um, if you have been to an ocean, you notice that the tide rises and sets. Uh, rises and uh, lowers over the years, and this is caused by the tidal force. We can harvest this energy. You know, some people build a tidal uh, power generator. Like as a tide rushes in and out, you can generate power. But if you can generate power out of something, that means something is losing energy, and that thing that losing energy is the moon orbiting around the Earth. All right, the moon orbits around the Earth as as it causes friction. The water slosh in and out of the t uh, as the tides. It causes friction, and this friction causes the moon to recede a little further away. And at the same time, the Earth spins a little slower. We know that the Earth used to spin a lot faster. We know that back um, a couple million years ago, there, there was 400 years, days in a year. We know this because we look for some clams, and uh, each day the tide goes in and out, they make a little shells, but each year there's a variation of seasons. So we can count how many days there are in the years from clams, fossils record. And we know that at some time in the past, there were 400 days in a year. But now there's only 365. And eventually, once in a while, you might hear something like leap seconds uh, because the Earth's spinning slow enough that you know, our clock can't keep up. So we're going to have to manually readjust the clock. And that's part of that. There's nothing we can do to do, to do about it. We're not going to worry about it because it's one inch out of 400,000 kilometers, all right? Okay, do we, are we up? okay, sure. More questions? Um, I heard you talking about, my name is Abed Nico, um, I'm a form four. Um, I heard you talking about um, the, the moon moving in a, getting closer to the earth. I don't know if it's closer or further. So I wondered, um, could the Earth be moving in a spiral instead of an elliptical orbit, which results in global warming? And then the second question was that, um, are you trying to develop a way to go to outer space, maybe at high speed, such as light speed, for example? And the third question is, are you studying black holes? And uh, if you are, is there any way that we as Earth um, could have a chance to one day harness unlimited energy. Yes. Many good questions. I'm going to have a hard time keeping all of them in my head. Okay, so uh, with the moon, um, was some, um, the, what was, sorry, I, f I forgot the first question, the moon. Okay. Oh yes. The, so the global warming, the, uh, the global warming we worry about has nothing to do with the orbit. We know that the Earth orbit around, actually around the Sun, has changed and it has caused some climate, um, large-scale climate change over the years. But this is not the, what we are seeing right now. What we are seeing right now is a very sharp increase in carbon dioxide. We know that carbon dioxide it's a, a greenhouse gas effect. Um, the best example of greenhouse as effect is, you know, if you ever step into a car as it parked outside in the sun, yeah, what happens? It gets pretty steamy inside, right? Really hot, right? Why is that? Because, well, there's a windshield in the car. The windshield allows the sunlight to go in, but it doesn't allow the heat to escape. So it, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and that's why the inside the car is really hot. Well, carbon dioxide does the same thing with the windshield. So it's going to make the Earth warmer. And we've seen this in the past with the fossils records and the ice polar ice caps and everything. We know that the temperature can fluctuate, which is part of a normal Earth cycle. The, if you pick any random point of the Earth, the atmosphere and the temperature would look nothing like what we have today. But the rate at which carbon dioxide is increasing this past couple, this past 100 years is astronomical compared to what it has been. 
and we know that this is caused by our activities. We're, we're digging carbon that has been locked inside the fossil, uh, the fossil fuel, and we're burning at the rate as has, the Earth has never seen before. So this is something that we're a little worrying, and uh, it's going to take a combined effort from everyone around the world to just to barely stop the progress. And right now, the best hope is to stop this progress from going. We don't have a hope of reversing it yet, but maybe someday we will, okay? Um, so the next question about the, about the, the black holes, also oh, this also runs through the same problem with, uh, well, we're trying to study the black hole because it's interesting, but not because we're hoping to harness anything out of it because it's too far away. You know, the next soccer ball is still, like it's still in, in Europe, right? So that's, that's, we're not gonna get there anytime soon. But what's interesting about black holes is uh, it's a part where some really interesting physics merges. So two of the best theory that we have to describe the universe that we live in, everything, are general relativity and quantum mechanics. The problem is general relativity likes to explain things that are really big, really massive. But quantum mechanics explain things that are really small, tiny subatomic things. Well, there happens to be one place where both of these things happen at the same time, and that's inside a black hole. So black holes can be something that really interesting. It is served as a test for general relativity, and maybe it will unlock something. Maybe it will reveal us that someday um, we can have another theory. We can learn that quantum mechanics and general relativity may be one of the same theory, but that's something we just can't keep, keep our eyes on, okay? Okay. Uh, my name is Tavis from Lotani SSS. My question is that do parallel universe exist? That's a good question. That's an excellent question. But let me ask you this. So by definition, parallel universe is a universe that does not intersect with ours, right? Something that happens alongside ours, we can't go there, and there's nothing, we can observe it. So the question is, if it does exist, how would you prove that it exists? That's a really tough question. Because by definition, we cannot go there, and it cannot send anything to us. So how would we even prove that it exists? So that's, a, you know, that's more of a philosophical question, but you know. Um, but I mean, if we just think about whether the possibility of it, yeah, we can talk about that. So science tend to be the, uh, the branch of um, study that only sticks with something that we can prove. Um, parallel universe is kind of impossible to prove by what I just said, right? But that doesn't stop us from pondering or questioning about it. Because another thing science is good at is questioning the reality of everything. And whether the reality of the law of physics that we know would allow for such thing like a parallel universe. And a quick answer is yes. And there are many different ways a parallel universe can exist. Like for example, if the universe is really infinitely far, right? And if you like travel one direction far enough, eventually I'm gonna run into a place where it looks exactly like planet Earth and have you and me, right? Because if it's large enough, eventually you're gonna run into that at some point. That could be one version of a parallel universe. Another people say, when you, every time, quantum mechanics is like flipping a coin, it could go either way. And some, some version says, you know, each time you flip a coin quantum mechanically, there are universes that exist for each different results of the coin flip that happens. And there could be millions of many different parallel universes. But, um, but if you were talking about real science, how would that would affect us that implicate that's you know something still quite a ways away. But that doesn't stop us from imagining and that's definitely doesn't make doesn't stop us from making such a really cool science fiction movies and stories out of it. And that's sometimes that's just all we need. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, really good uh, questions coming from the students. I'm glad I'm not the one to answer the questions. Um, because of uh, the issue of time, um, we would like to move towards the conclusion of the event. And uh, can we have uh, the Vice Chancellor and Dr. Saran to come and uh, do a token of appreciation?
அதை Before Matipon has to be. Thank you very much for bringing the direction. I'm looking up the <laughs> well, I, I know that uh, Botswana has got the largest number of el African elephants, right? Yeah. But this is Asian elephant. I, I, I don't think you have this. No, we don't have Asian <laughs> elephant. <laughs> Thank, <you. laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, Narit Thai uh, with uh, star map and Thai language. Uh, uh, the names of the star map. <laughs> Um, we, we are not doing well for time. I know that we have contracted with the parents of the students that will be here until five. We, we have moved uh, away from that. So I would like to call upon uh, Prof. Uh, Abraham Ataogu to come and do the closing. Professor Tutolo, the Vice Chancellor of uh, Beust, uh, Dr. Sarang, the Director of uh, NARIT in uh, Thailand, the representative of the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Communications, Knowledge and Technology, uh, distinguished uh, guests. Uh, I think it's a honor uh, for Beust that we are receiving very important visitors uh, from NARIT to share with us the fascinating work that they are doing in the area of astronomy. And what is so good about it is that the future leaders in astronomy, they are sitting here, they are the school uh, pupils who are here with us today. They are going to be leading uh, astronomy uh, in Botswana. I don't need to market astronomy to anybody after listening to this talk by Dr. Sarang today. I think it's so clearly uh, marketed. Because sometimes people wonder and say, oh, why should you invest so much money in astronomy? Oh, it's a very expensive hobby. Some people call it 
hobby. But today we have seen that astronomy is not about just a hobby. It is the factory, it is the foundry of ideas for industrial development. If you truly want to have industrial development, you must do astronomy because it throws all the challenges at you, whether it's microelectronics, whether it's robotics, whether it's optics, whichever area you look at. I was really fascinated when Dr. Sarang was talking about the Raman spectroscopy work they are doing. Because of the high level work they do with light, they now use the light in more specialized areas because Raman spectroscopy is specific, but time resolved is so useful in the sense that we should be number one in Raman spectroscopy, and we are, because we have diamond. And the, the surest way to identify diamond is Raman spectroscopy. It's got a signature that you can't uh, miss. So when you look at how they have presented it to us, if we want to develop in robotics, we have to continue to do astronomy. If we want to develop in optics, we have to continue to do astronomy. I look at all the things they are doing, and I start to think of night vision systems. Because, yeah, this is the type of work that the future generations here will be doing, and then we'll be making them here. Those cameras, hyperspectral cameras, will make them made in Botswana. Yesterday, Botswana won gold for sports. Future, we're going to win gold for what? For making hyperspectral cameras, optical systems, robotics. That is where, that is where it's all going. So the real challenge point is astronomy. It brings all the sciences together under one umbrella. So it is, it is really a momentous occasion that BUST is uh, hosting the SKAVN, and then we are partnering with the best in the world, including NARIT in uh, astronomy. So I think the most important thing that has happened today is that knowledge transfer has already happened between NARIT, BUST, and the students who are going to lead astronomy in the future. So I think this is a time for celebration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Ogu. Um, just maybe to make these few announcements as we uh, depart. We will immediately move towards the Botswana Satellite uh, Ground Station. Um, I would have loved for the students to go and see it, but uh, the physics teacher will make that decision, so that is not my decision. But as soon as you, you are from there, you will get your refreshments. Then we, we will definitely have uh, more engagements with you, the students. Uh, this is your place. So um, that's what we are going to do as we uh, depart from here. You'll get your refreshments. I think they are somewhere by the door there. Then maybe you can go to the bus. The physics teacher will decide on uh, how you are going to go. Um, as for all our dignitaries, uh, we will immediately move towards the Botswana Satellite Ground Station. Uh, you will be served refreshments there. And um, everything else we will continue from there. There will be a stargazing activity that will be taking place there. I once again take this opportunity to invite you to a yet another public talk by Dr. Matipon. That will be done in Khaburoni on Sunday. Those of you who usually use your Sundays to go for jazz, this is a different kind of entertainment. So you, you must uh, miss the jazz and go and uh, listen to Dr. Matipon do his uh, presentation. Um, I've been asked to uh, request the Vice Chancellor and Dr. Saran to remain behind because the Botswana television is here. They would want you to conduct interviews with uh, both of you. So um, that was the last announcement that I'm making, but otherwise, uh, the ushers will be here. They will usher you to the Botswana Satellite Ground Station. Uh, the project lead is here. There, there is many similarities between us and Thailand. What exactly what uh, Dr. Saran was presenting would be exactly what Dr. Mpueling would be presenting on the Botswana Satellite. Very similar uh, storylines. 
So I think uh, we and the Thais, we, we must investigate. Maybe we are from the same mother. <laughs> so um, it was declared that the afternoon is a holiday for everybody, but you chose to spend your holiday here. So I think we thank you very much for, for that. Thank you.